you noticed just now, when we finished chanting. The sound of the crickets was suddenly a lot louder. It's not that the crickets suddenly sang louder, but for us it seemed louder because we were more quiet. This is an important principle in training the mind. The more quiet you are, the more you see. We talk often how much that there is a doing, that there is a karma in every present moment. There are choices you make with every present moment, and sometimes the emphasis may seem too much on the doing. But remember that being quiet is also a form of doing, and sometimes it's the most skillful doing, the most skillful thing you can do. Try to keep the mind as quiet as possible, as still as possible, as if you're listening to music far, far away and you want to hear, trying to make out the tones, make out the, the, the melody. You have to make yourself very quiet. In the same way, if you want to see things, you have to make yourself very quiet. See things in the mind, see things in the breath. The more quiet the mind is, the more it sees. So when the breath comes in, the breath goes out, the mind doesn't have to come in and out with the breath. You choose a spot in the body where you want to stay, and you stay right there. The John Lee gives the image of a post at the edge of the sea. The tide comes in, the tide goes out, the waves come in, the waves go out, but the post doesn't come in and out along with the tide or along with the waves. It stays right where it was, where it has been all along. And because it stays, you can tell exactly how high and how low the tides are, how far the waves have come in. The more still you are, the more you have something to measure things against. It's like those measuring things they have next to their, I don't know what they call them, to tell what the flood level is. Those things have to stay in place. If they don't stay in place, they're totally useless. Or you can make another comparison with the equipment you use in a scientific experiment. If the equipment is placed on a table that wobbles, or if an earthquake happens and shoves everything down to the floor, the things that get measured by that equipment are, or the measurements that come out of that equipment are worthless. You have to throw them away. So it is with the mind. When the mind is moving around like that, you can't really see things for what they are. You simply go along with the flow, but how fast or how slow the flow is, you don't know. So when we sit here and meditate, try to find a spot that's comfortable and then just stay right there. You don't have to do a lot of things. Just do one thing consistently. And this way you have some way of measuring the breath, the ins and outs of the breath. You have a way of also measuring the movements of the mind. Once you have that reference point, then the, even the most subtle movements become clear. But if you move around a lot, you have no idea whether other things are still or moving around as well. So find a nice quiet spot to stay, and then just stay there as comfortably and as still as possible, and watch. Keep your mindfulness alert. Think of it as like throwing a pot on a potter's wheel. Put the clay in the wheel, and the wheel turns around, and you've got to make your mind as still as possible. You have to make your gaze as still as possible as you move your hands up along the clay to shape the pot. If you glance around, if your mind moves around, the pot is destroyed. Your hands suddenly lose their balance and go off in one direction or another. The difficulty, of course, is that the mind's not used to staying. It's used to running around. And if it wants to run around, there is that role for it in the meditation. You can move it through the body if you like. Remind yourself that the mind has lots of choices. There's no one right way to meditate all the time. You have to be sensitive to what's going on. 
Sometimes the em emphasis has to be on the stillness, other times it has to be on the reflection and on the contemplation, on comparing things. But always remember that you have this range of choices. So many times we get stuck in a particular way of type of behavior because we forget the choices that are available to us. And then we miss things. We it's like deer in the winter. When the snow falls again and again and again, the deer tend to follow the same path through the, the woods. And halfway through the winter you find that if you go along that path, the bark on either side of that path has been stripped clear off the trees. And they say that if it's a long winter and the deer strip all the bark off the trees next to the path and there's no more bark right there, they'll die. Even though there's plenty of bark in, rest in the rest of the forest, but they stay in that particular path. They don't wander off. And with so much, of, so many of us, that's the way it is with our minds. We have certain types of ways of behavior, certain patterns of behavior, and we just stay right there. We forget the other alternatives that are available to us. So when you find that your mind is too busy in the meditation trying to figure things out, remind yourself that you also have that, the alternative of being very still. If you find that being still gets too boring, you remind yourself, well, you do have the other alternative of moving around, but you test it for a while and see if it's the right alternative. Maybe being still was the right thing to do, it's simply that you were getting impatient. In that case, you turn on your impatience. Who is this that I have to listen to? Of course, when you track down the impatience, when you track down that voice that was speaking in your mind and complaining in your mind, you realize there's nothing behind it. It's just a role that the mind takes on. But you don't necessarily have to believe it, because there's not necessarily anybody there. The important thing is you realize you have these this range of choices as you meditate. And as you get better at the meditation, you get a better sense of what is the appropriate time for being still? What is the appropriate time for contemplating and questioning things and trying to figure them out? One easy test is if you're trying to figure things out and instead of getting clearer, they get more and more complex, more blurry, that's the time to be still again. Just sit for a while and be very, very still to watch. And then after a while you get a sense of when the mind has had enough stillness. In the beginning parts of the practice, a good rule of thumb is that you want to be as still as much as you can. Because it's the stillness that gives you a perspective. Don't be in too great a hurry to gain insight. Don't be in too great a hurry to figure things out. Because the real sensitivity that's going to open up new channels of possibilities in your mind has to come from these points of being very, very still. So even though part of your mind may start telling you, this is stupid, this is crazy, you're not learning anything, you're just sitting still, 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 what are you going to learn from that? Remind yourself, you learn perspective, you learn sensitivity. You're putting yourself in a good position to see things. And just as a hunter can't control when the game is going to come past, you can't control when the opportunities for insight are going to come. But you can position yourself in the good, in the right place, right here at the breath, very still, very calm, very watchful. Because when real insights come, there's both the stillness and the, the alertness, the contemplation. They come together in points like that. And because for most of us the stillness is the hardest thing to learn, that's what we've got to emphasize the most. <laughs>